there's a battle in the heartland. It's a rematch between incumbent Republican Rodney Davis. This is going to be the highest turnout election, I believe, in our nation's history. And Democratic challenger Betsy Dirksen Londrigan. And people across central Illinois are scared. Each one fighting for your vote in Illinois' 13th congressional district. They differ on health care, taxes, and job creation. In 2018, Davis won by 2,058 votes. It's expected to be the most contested race Illinoisans will see this November. Both the National Republican Congressional Committee <coughs> and the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee have targeted this race as one to watch. It's now up to you on who wins and takes control of this district for the next two years. Illinois Public Media, WCIA3 News, and the League of Women Voters present... The Illinois 13th Congressional District Debate. Your local election headquarters welcomes you to the 2020 Illinois 13th Congressional Debate. I'm Jessica Coons, evening anchor for WCIA 3 News. The 13th Congressional District makes up the central portion of the state. It includes Calhoun, Christian, DeWitt, Green, Jersey, Macon, Macoupin, Montgomery, and Piatt counties. Portions of Bond, Champaign, Madison, McLean, and Sangamon counties are also included in the district. Now let's go to our debate moderator, Brian Mackey. Thank you, Jessica. I'm Brian Mackey of Illinois Public Media. I host the daily talk show, The 21st. I want to thank our co-sponsors, the League of Women Voters of Champaign County, which is helping us to time this debate, and WCIA-TV, which is allowing us to have this debate in its studios. To practice social distancing in this era of COVID-19, it's just me, the candidates, and the floor crew, and no audience. In a moment, we'll begin our discussion with incumbent Republican U.S. Representative Rodney Davis and Democratic challenger Betsy Dirksen Londrigan. But first, the format for tonight's debate. Each candidate has a minute and a half to answer a question. The opposing candidate then has 30 seconds for a response, with another 30 seconds for the original candidate to rebut. After that, we'll move on to the next question. Both campaigns agreed to this format weeks ago. Neither candidate has seen tonight's questions. Now let's meet our panel of journalists who are joining us from across the district. In the rotunda of the State House is WCIA Capitol Bureau Chief Mark Maxwell. Also in the rotunda, at a safe distance, is Mary Hansen, a reporter with NPR Illinois in Springfield. And Chris Coates is the Central Illinois editor for Lee Enterprises and joins us from the Herald and Review newspaper in Decatur. Before we begin, we also want to wish President Trump, as well as the 30,000 other Americans still hospitalized with COVID-19, a quick and full recovery. Let's get started. A coin toss has determined that the first question is for Democratic challenger Betsy Dirksen Londrigan. Public health experts agree that people who do not wear masks are potentially putting others at risk of catching COVID-19. Illinois requires masks, but many states do not, and there remains resistance among a significant share of our fellow citizens. Ms. Dirksen Londrigan, would you support a national mask mandate? If so, how should it be enforced? And if not, how can you ensure that more people are wearing masks? I think that Illinois should be held up as a leader. You know, our leaders have listened to the science and our positivity rates are very low. You know, I think what we're seeing happening with over 200,000 deaths and here in Illinois, over 300,000 positive tests, uh, we know that we have to do better and we have to make sure that people are wearing their masks, washing, washing their hands and socially distancing. But that's not enough. Uh, what I'd like to see is some national leadership. And I think the fact that you know, we were all shocked when we found out that President Trump, um, and I am very happy that he and his wife are doing better. Um, I'm, I was shocked, though, when I heard him, in his own words, say that he knew the virus was deadly, he knew it was airborne, and he lied to the American public about it repeatedly. And there was no national plan. We have to do better. Now look where we are right now. We're in Champaign, Illinois. The University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign showed us and is continuing to show us what a national plan could be based on. They, have, they worked together. They unified. 
they have testing, tracing their own COVID protocols. This is how we get students back to school, how we get workers back to work, and how we get our economy reopened. I want to see leadership at the national level. I think we all deserve that, and let's use U of I as a role model. And that's time. Congressman Davis, you have 30 seconds to respond. Well, thank you. Unlike my opponent, I do not support a national mask mandate. I think the best decisions are made at the local level and the state level. And we need to make sure we give our local leaders and our state leaders the flexibility they need to ensure that they're going to be able to get through this crisis as well as they know how. I agree. Our college campuses are doing a great job in proving to the rest of the world how to address infections. Here in Champaign, even with one of the best testing modalities, we see 2,500 cases, but they're able to deal with those cases because we give them the chance to do it at the local level. That is 30 seconds, Congressman. Ms. Dirksen Londrigan, 30 seconds to rebut. I think it's important to note that here in Champaign Urbana, where they have had a unified plan, their positivity rate as of today is less than one half of 1%. That's why students can get back to school at the college. It's why the community businesses can begin to reopen. And that's what we're all looking for here. We need a national plan where we can get people back to work safely, get students back to school safely, and get our economy reopened. Our next question is for Congressman Davis. As I said earlier, we wish the President and First Lady a full and quick recovery. Before his diagnosis, the president has generally refused to wear a mask, has mocked others for wearing one, and in a series of comments has repeatedly downplayed the scope and severity of this disease. I want to ask you, as an honorary co-chair of President Trump's re-election campaign, how much responsibility does he bear for repeatedly downplaying the dangers of COVID-19? Well, Brian, I wish the president and the first lady well. I'm glad that they seem to be going through this infection as asymptomatic as I did back in August. I feel blessed that the only symptoms I had were a slight fever and a little bit of loss of taste and smell. And after 10 days, I was able to get off of quarantine. At the same time, I encouraged people to follow the CDC guidelines. I did follow the CDC guidelines when my doctors think I would have picked up the infection a couple of days before my initial diagnosis. But even then, we still saw the infection infected me. And even with the best testing modality system in the world at the White House, it can still get through. We're all learning about a disease that no one on Earth knew existed even a year ago. We're doing great and working in a bipartisan way at the beginning of this pandemic to address many of the issues of investing in therapeutics that the president has been taking investing in vaccine development. Those are the things that I promised I would do at the beginning of this pandemic. Now, there's a lot of blame to go around from Republicans and Democrats, but the bottom line is not one time in my seven and a half years as your congressman has anybody come to me and said, we need to address a national stockpile issue. We need to work on pandemic response. That's got to change in the future. And that's why I've introduced a bill to create a coronavirus commission to Monday morning quarterback this thing to death after it's over. Ms. Dirksen Lundrigan, 30 seconds. Well, with no national plan in place, states were pitted against one another, frantically trying to figure out where they could get protective gear for their essential workers, uh, where they could get testing, how they could build it. Uh, we have to do better, and we can do better, and we should have done better. You know, and I am happy that the congressman and his family are doing well and made it through COVID. He had access to rapid testing. President Trump had access to rapid testing. They both have access to excellent health care. And that's why I'm in this race, because I want everyone and to have that, access to health care. That is time. Congressman Davis, another 30 seconds. Do you think the president is responsible? You know, my constituents have access to rapid testing at the Walgreens facility in Springfield, Illinois, that I used and my wife used and, and many use on a daily basis. I'm proud of that public-private partnership. The president has access to testing. But unfortunately, on Capitol Hill, the workers, the workers that keep the place clean, the workers that protect that house, they don't have access to the same testing. And Nancy Pelosi... Her supporter is the one holding that back while I've been leading the charge to make sure that our frontline workers on Capitol Hill are protected. Thank you, Congressman. Our next question comes from Mary Hansen in Springfield. Mary. 
Uh, this question is for Ms. Dirksen Londrigan. Um, in Illinois, uh, 50,000 more households applied for a statewide rental assistance program than it could serve. Housing advocates say more federal money needs to be made available for rent and housing assistance during the COVID-19 crisis. Do you believe that Congress should step in and make this money available? Absolutely believe that Congress needs to step in and make more funding available. Um, you know, I hear from people all over central Illinois, and they and their families are stressed beyond belief because they're trying to figure out how they're going to hold on to their home, how they're going to pay their electrical bills, how they're going to get their groceries. Um, you know, just this week, I was over at the Boys and Girls Clubs in Springfield um, passing out boxes of food as part of a food drive. The cars were lined up for three blocks, and that is heartbreaking. And this is where people are at. You know, Congress does a lot of things. We found out when it came to the Supreme Court nomination that the Senate can actually move very quickly when they want to. I wish they were putting that same energy into helping families. People need their unemployment insurance extended. We need it bumped up. We also need to make sure that our small businesses can stay afloat. And that means making sure that there is more money in the payment protection program. Because I do believe that we can all come together and that we can beat this virus. But we have to make sure that when we get to the other side of this, that we have our families intact, that we have our small businesses intact, and that we have an economy that we can reopen so that we can get our workers back to work and our students back in school. Thank you. Congressman Davis, 30 seconds. Well, that is exactly why I joined my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to create the Paycheck Protection Program, the PPP program. It helps save so many mom and pop shops, like Lindy's, Lindy McDonald's auto repair shop here in Champaign, Illinois. She called, said, We need help. <clears throat> Never asked for government help before. These are the types of programs that can take place when we come together. And unfortunately, Nancy Pelosi has held up progress on another stimulus to help those who still need assistance. Ms. Dirksen Lundrigan, 30 seconds. You know, I agree. There have been a lot of businesses that were helped by the Payment Protection Program, and we have to refill those coffers. You know, one thing that I disagreed with Congressman Davis on is that he voted repeatedly against providing transparency to taxpayers on how that money was being spent. And what we have seen happen is that when the veil was finally lifted, even though he voted against the formation of oversight committee and voted against transparency measures, uh, we saw that a lot of that money went to companies who shouldn't have it. So let's refill the coffers, but let's make sure it's getting to where it's supposed to go. For our next question, we go to Decatur and Chris Coates. Congressman Davis, the New York Times has reported that the president paid no federal income taxes for 11 of the past 18 years and $750 in 2016 and 2017. As honorary co-chair of the president's Illinois campaign, can you explain how that's fair to working class voters in this district? Well, thank you, Chris. First, I want to respond to my opponent's last suggestion that I was against transparency in the Paycheck Protection Program. As a matter of fact, there was transparency provisions that were put in place by our bipartisan votes that created the four bills that we now commonly call the CARES Act. So my, and, and, and in all honesty, uh, the bill that she wanted me to vote for would have hidden paycheck protection loans for two million and under in every American. I want more transparency. I certainly want to see transparency across the board. So when you talk about the New York Times and the taxes, you know, we need to actually see what the New York Times is reporting. The president and his team have said that what is being reported is not true. They need to be able to have a chance to determine whether or not they're going to be able to respond to a story where they don't have all of the information. But let me tell you about my taxes. My tax, my tax reform bill that I helped pass, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, actually helped spur historic economic growth that we had and historic low unemployment that we had just before this pandemic began. The overwhelming highest percentage of money going back into family budgets went to middle class families. We brought American jobs back to America. That's what I said I was going to do when I asked for your vote 
to be your congressman. We made it happen, and I'm proud that we were able to work with this administration to get it done. Thank you. Ms. Dirksen Lodrigan, 30 seconds. It is ridiculous that a millionaire or billionaire uh, is paying $750 a year in taxes. The system is broken. I believe that if teachers, nurses, and grocery store workers are paying their fair share of taxes, then millionaires and billionaires should too. And the tax scam of 2017 that Congressman Davis was a face of, that resulted in companies like Amazon and Netflix paying nothing. And that is time. Congressman Davis, 30 seconds. Well, large companies were basing their operations overseas and not paying anything. We brought those dollars back to the United States. You know, my opponent clearly doesn't like our tax cut bill that put money in your pockets. So she wants to raise your taxes. That's probably why she supports Governor Pritzker's graduated income tax plan that can, that can effectively raise middle class, tax, middle class families' taxes. It's all about more government for Betsy Londrigan, <laughs> not me. Thank you. We go to, back to the State House for our next question from Mark Maxwell. Mark. This question is for Betsy Dirksen Londrigan. Uh, the world is watching as some of the largest drug companies in the world compete and race to try and develop a vaccine or a treatment for COVID-19. You've argued that often these drug companies can charge patients too much. Yet others have warned that if we cap what a drug company can charge for what they create, it might limit what they can come up with and make. So how do you do that? How do you lower the cost of prescription drugs without stifling innovation in the lab? Well, look, I hear from people in every corner of the district about the high cost of prescription drugs. And people, Mark, people are making horrible choices in their own lives to pay for their prescriptions. They're rationing their drugs, uh, or they're making a decision between whether or not they can go to the grocery store or refill their prescription. And we have to do better than that. I want to allow Medicare to negotiate for drug prices directly with pharmaceutical companies. Medicare has the largest number of enrollees who are the biggest consumers of prescription drugs. That's purchasing power. Let's unleash that and let's bring the cost of prescription drugs down for everyone. And the lower prescription drug costs bill that Congressman Davis voted against also took money from those savings and put it back into the National Institute for Health for research. And we have to do that. It's not a surprise, though. Now, Congressman Davis has taken millions of dollars in corporate PAC money. He's taken over $200,000 from big pharma corporate PACs alone. And then he voted against lowering the cost of prescription drugs. I want to make sure that if people need their prescription refilled, they don't have to make that kind of heart-wrenching decision. And we can do that by allowing Medicare to negotiate for drug prices and bring costs down for everyone, we can do better. Thank you. Congressman, 30 seconds. Let's look at the facts. The bill that I supported actually would have, would have made sure that there were 15 more cures. Now, I don't want to be the person picking out the 15 families with pre-existing conditions and saying your cures are not going, to, not going to move forward because we passed a bill that Betsy Londrigan supports. Now, our bill would lower costs, but let's look at the facts. We have made sure that uh, generic patents have gone through at historic rates. Medicare Part D premiums have gone down the past two years Thank in you, a row. Thank you, Congressman. We're doing That's our job. 30 seconds. Betsy Dirksen Londrigan, another 30 seconds. Congressman Davis, after taking over $200,000 from big pharma corporate PACs, voted against lowering the cost of prescription drugs. Those are the facts. That is not a congressman who is going to help our senior citizens afford their drugs. You met Hannah. Hannah just recently appeared in one of our ads because she was so upset about the cost of her epilepsy medicine. This is a real life issue that needs real life solutions. Thank you. Mary Hansen has our next question from Springfield. Uh, this question is for Congressman Davis. Uh, the first coronavirus aid package suspended federal student loan payments. Uh, the president recently extended that through the end of the year. Um, it also included a tax benefit that you've proposed for employers to pay up to $5,200 tax-free towards an employee's student debt. What more should Congress do to alleviate the burden of student loans? Well, first off, I'd like to address the attack 
uh, that was made by my opponent on me just a second ago. Uh, she says she doesn't take corporate PAC money, but takes corporate PAC money in advertisements from many of the folks who are raising money from big pharma and insurance companies. And her mortgage is literally paid for by corporate lobbying with big pharma clients. Let's be honest. These are the things that matter to the American people. You don't need to lie about my record, and let's make sure we keep the facts straight. Mm -hmm. One of the proudest moments I've had was seeing my student loan repayment program pass as part of the CARES Act. This is a way that a public-private partnership can exist to help address a student debt crisis in this country. Many of the, the CEO of Chegg and other companies that, that are working with college students every day have made this their pro top priority. And what will happen is it's going to make sure that new graduates who are going into the workforce can now negotiate with their employers who will be incentivized to offer up to $5,250 per year to pay down their student debt. This is a common sense approach that I told you I was going to pass when I first asked for your vote. This is why I'm one of the most bipartisan members of Congress. I'm going to continue to be a bipartisan voice and address the issues that are most important to the constituents of the 13th District, just like this issue is for our college students. Ms. Dirksen Lodrigan, uh, 30 seconds to respond. Sure. Uh, Congressman Davis, uh, Trump's co-chair for his 2020 re-election campaign, votes 91% of the time with President Trump. So uh, let's keep the facts clear on your uh, supposed bipartisanship. Um, look, when it comes to college affordability and paying off student loans, we have over 100,000 college students here in central Illinois. So we need to make sure that we are allowing them to refinance and that we are providing alternatives. And that's time. Congressman, 30 seconds. Refinancing doesn't help pay down the debt. Well, actual solutions like my bill that is now law will help students get into the workforce and begin to be able to save for their future and achieve the American dream. These are the common sense solutions that come from somebody who's ranked by nonpartisan ranking institutions like the Luger Center is the 13th most bipartisan member out of 435 members in the House. Don't listen to the talking points. Listen to the facts. Thank you. Our next question is from Chris Coates in Decatur. And it's a question about your support for a government-run insurance plan and the possible impact on rural hospitals. A study by a hospital and insurance trade group says up to 39 rural hospitals in Illinois could close as a result. And of course, we have a lot of those types of rural hospitals in our district. How do you weigh that kind of possible impact with your support for so-called Medicare X? Sure. Well, the whole reason I got into this race in the first place is to protect the Affordable Care Act. And that remains my number one priority. We have to make sure that every person can get to the doctor when they need to. And you know, this is a personal issue for me and my family. When my son was 12, he was in the pediatric intensive care unit of our children's hospital in Springfield. He had surgery, was put into a medically induced coma, had a ventilator that was breathing for him, and was read last rites, not once, but twice. And I know every day of my life that if we had not had access to good medical care, I would be a mom of two and not three. And if we hadn't had good insurance, it would have bankrupt our family. So making sure that every person has access to quality affordable care is my number one concern. We have to drive down the costs. We can do that in a couple of ways. One is by introducing a public option, a Medicare public option that I would only support working in concert with the hospitals to make sure that they can maintain their excellent standard of care. That can help drive down costs. Now what Congressman Davis doesn't want you to know is that each of those 11 times that he voted to repeal the Affordable Care Act with no replacement, he voted to gut Medicaid, which could shutter those 39 hospitals here in Illinois. Congressman Davis, 30 seconds. Yeah, procedural votes that have no impact on a, on a replacement or on the bill that's passing don't count as 11 votes. The one vote that counted protected pre-existing condition coverage for every single American because it's personal to me. My wife's a 21-year cancer survivor, and every single time Betsy Londrigan and her corporate PAC-funded allies like Big Pharma come after me 
and they say that I want to get rid of pre-existing conditions, that's an attack on my wife. It's an attack on my family. And that's something that needs to stop. Ms. Dirksen Londrigan, 30 seconds. He voted 11 times to repeal the Affordable Care Act with no replacement. Unless somebody walked up and pressed the button when you weren't looking, every one of those 11 times, that was you. 11 times to repeal the Affordable Care Act with no replacement. Make no mistake about it. It would have gutted protections for people with pre-existing conditions. It would it risked shuttering rural hospitals and taking away every essential health benefit that we all count on. And the last question of this half hour goes to Mark Maxwell in Springfield. Mark. Congressman, the Trump administration is now suing in court in a case that could go before the Supreme Court that might end the Affordable Care Act. You did vote to support that lawsuit initially, but then on September 24th said that you had changed your mind and no longer supported that legal challenge because it wouldn't be right to take away someone's health care during a pandemic. Does that mean that you now acknowledge your earlier support for the lawsuit could have in fact had that effect of taking away someone's health care? The vote you're talking about, Mark, was a vote on the House Rules Package that is, goes way beyond gimmick lines like supporting a lawsuit. There were plenty of rules that I disagreed with, and I voted no. But that was not a standalone bill. It's interesting to note in the last response, my opponent did not shy away from her support for Medicare X, which would close up to 39 rural hospitals in central Illinois, in, in Illinois, many that could be in places like Monticello, Clinton, Staunton, Taylorville, Litchfield, Hillsboro, and others. Now, the Affordable Care Act, we need to fix it. It's leaving 60 million Americans behind. And at one point before tonight, my opponent actually agreed that it needed to be fixed. But I think she seems to have changed her mind and wants to protect it while leaving out those 60 million Americans that don't have health insurance because they can't afford it or they have it and they can't afford to use it. So we're in the middle of a pandemic, Mark. And I've said all along, and I voted to make sure that we don't move forward with this lawsuit. And when, if, it, if the administration does, they're not going to have any funding to do that. I've also introduced a bill that would allow people to keep their employer-based health care, allow us to play, pay the employer share for COBRA, and open up the exchange for 30 days. That's a bipartisan bill that I introduced because I'm the most bipartisan legislator in the entire Illinois delegation, Republican or Democrat. Ms. Dirksen Londrigan, 30 seconds for a response. Congressman Davis is going to keep trying to distract you so you don't look at his disastrous record on health care. He voted three times to support this lawsuit that the Supreme Court's going to hear on November 10th to completely overturn the Affordable Care Act. And each of the 11 times that he voted to repeal the Affordable Care Act with no replacement, he voted to gut Medicaid that these rural hospitals depend on. Every one of those votes was to gut those hospitals. Thank you. Congressman, 30 seconds. Betsy, it's been like this for four years now. No matter how many times you say something, it doesn't make it true. The facts are the facts. I voted for a bill, a replacement, that fell short of supporting the Senate that would have protected pre-existing condition coverage. This is personal for me and my family. My wife has a genetic form of cancer that could affect my kids. There's absolutely no way that I'm going to support a plan that's not going to include pre-existing condition coverage. Quit lying. And yet you did. That's it for our first half hour. We'll have more after a break. We're going to be asking the candidates about calls for police reform, the structure of the U.S. Supreme Court, and climate change. You're watching the 13th Congressional District Debate presented by Illinois Public Media, WCIA-TV, and the League of Women Voters of Champaign County. We're back in two minutes.
Your local election headquarters welcomes you back to the 2020 Illinois 13th Congressional Debate. Good evening again. I'm Jessica Coons. We want to remind you to follow along at home using the hashtag ILVotes2020 on social media. Let's get right back to the questions with moderator Brian Mackey. Thank you, Jessica. I'm Brian Mackey, the host of the 21st talk show at Illinois Public Media. I'm joined here in the WCIA studios by Democratic challenger Betsy Dirksen Londrigan and incumbent Republican Congressman Rodney Davis. We are practicing social distancing during this debate. Only the candidates, floor crew, and I are in the studio. Joining us from across the district, WCIA Capitol Bureau Chief Mark Maxwell is in the State House in Springfield tonight. Mary Hansen, a reporter with NPR Illinois in Springfield, also joins us from the Capitol Rotunda. And Chris Coates is the Central Illinois editor for Lee Enterprises and joins us from the Herald and Review newspaper in Decatur. Now we're going to get back to the questions. The first one is for Betsy Dirksen Londrigan. If Judge Amy Coney Barrett is confirmed by the Senate for a seat on the Supreme Court, there would be a six to three conservative majority. Some on the left have called for appointing additional justices to the court, which would require an act of Congress. Would you vote for legislation that would expand the size of the U.S. Supreme Court? No, I don't believe in expanding the size of the Supreme Court. You know, I think what we have seen, as I mentioned earlier, is that when the Senate wants to move quickly on something, that they can. And what I wish that they would prioritize right now is making sure that our working families get the funds that they need to stay afloat, that our small businesses get the funds that they need to stay afloat, so that when we get to the other side of this pandemic, that they are that we don't have an economy that we can't, you know, we restart. But going back to the Supreme Court for a minute, you know, we've got two really important dates coming up. November 10th. November 10th is when the Supreme Court is going to hear the case to overturn the Affordable Care Act completely. Our health care is going to be on the ballot on the second important date here, November 3rd. November 3rd is when we vote. And are we going to trust that we're going to have somebody who is going to protect pre-existing conditions? That isn't going to force women back into the dark ages where the simple act of being a woman is a pre-existing condition? Are we going to have somebody who is going to make sure that your family doesn't go bankrupt because of one medical emergency or a chronic illness? Well, we've had years of Rodney Davis voting to repeal the Affordable Care Act, and our votes are not safe with him. Congressman, 30 seconds to respond. Well, I agree with Betsy that we shouldn't have a vote to expand the court. Uh, but she's right. November 3rd is an important day for our health care. A vote for Betsy Londrigan is a vote to close some of our biggest economic engines in the rural parts of this district, our rural hospitals. Imagine having a family member that has a heart attack and needs to be stabilized before they can go to a larger facility. And those hospitals aren't going to be there if Betsy Londrigan gets elected. Ms. Dirksen Londrigan, 30 seconds. 11 times. Congressman Davis voted to gut your health care, to gut protections for people with pre-existing conditions, to take away every essential health benefit that the Affordable Care Act gives us. Eleven times. He has bragged about it. He has celebrated it. Congressman Davis wants to tear down our health care system. I am in this race to protect your health care. Thank you. And mm -hmm. Congressman, I know you're going to be tempted to want to respond to that, but this is such an important issue, and I do want to ask now about climate change. About a year ago, Moody's Investors Service issued a report projecting that the greatest rise in extreme temperatures among U.S. counties will occur in large parts of the Midwest, particularly Missouri and western Illinois, and their map includes most of the 13th Congressional District, and they say that extreme heat threatens to curb agricultural production here. What specific actions have you taken to address this threat to your constituents? Well, I've helped address issues when it comes to the farm bill and our agricultural sector, where we have put together some of the most innovative conservation measures and incentives that are given to our farmers and our producers to continue to grow food that feeds the world, not just us. They deserve a lot of opportunities to help play a role. But let's also look at the totality. Climate change is real. 
the United States is leading the way in addressing carbon emissions. The United States is the only country, the only uh, major industrial country that would have met the Paris Agreement Accords. World leaders, climate activists are allowing China to continue to pollute not just their country, but pollute the atmosphere at levels that are above the United States, and the European Union, and others combined. We're doing our part in the United States, even though we only control about 14 to 16 percent of global emissions. Maybe we ought to have a United States of America agreement that countries should sign on to to do what we're doing. We need an all of the above energy approach. Unfortunately, my opponent and her corporate funded PAC allies support shutting down our coal fired power plants. They support shutting down our nuclear facilities that give us the baseload generating capacity and allow senior citizens on fixed income to be able to afford their bills. That's not who you want in Congress. Thank you, Ms. Dirksen Lundrigan. 30 seconds to respond. Farmers in central Illinois have seen historic flooding the last couple of years. What I believe that we need to do is we need to make bigger investments in conservation. We need to help them make the changes that they're going to need to combat climate change over the course of the next 10, 20, 30 years. And those conservation dollars can help them do that, you know, whether it's through cover crops or no-till farming, um, precision management. There's a lot of things that we can do uh, to help our farmers be part of the solution for climate change. Congressman, 30 seconds. Well, Ms. Laudner, you're going to be happy to know that that's exactly what we did, working with our agricultural sector and those who lead in conservation measures to put those incentives in place. That's what happens when you have somebody in Washington who is the 13th most bipartisan member out of 435 members of the U.S. House. You get stuff done when people can work together across the aisle. That's what I promised you I would do when I asked for your vote every single election we've been able to win. And I'm asking for your vote again to continue that bipartisanship. Our next question comes from Mary Hansen in Springfield. Mary. Uh, this question is for Ms. Dirksen Londrigan. Uh, protests and demonstrations continue against police brutality sparked by the deaths of Breonna Taylor in Louisville and George Floyd in Minneapolis. Police oversight is largely a local issue. What role should Congress play in police reform? Um, you know, there, we all saw, watched George Floyd uh, get murdered on television this summer. And there were a lot of protests that rose out of it with a lot of important messages. I want to say very clearly that any of the violence that has happened around these protests, I 100% condemn and believe those people need to be prosecuted. And hate to think that they would take anything away from the actual message that needs to be addressed, and that is uh, systemic racism. We have to address what's happening in our law enforcement. We do. And we need to do that by making sure that we have implicit bias training, crisis intervention training. And after talking with sheriffs here in central Illinois, you know what they would welcome? Additional team members who are trained in addiction counseling, mental health crisis counseling. We have to recognize that not every 911 call needs an um, armed intervention. We have to address the message, though, that has been brought up by the protests because it's so important. It's a, about knowing and seeing that racism exists in every corner of our society. It's about rooting out the racism in our health care system. Why are black mothers dying at a higher rate than white mothers? It's about addressing the racism in our educational system and in our housing. Uh, I'm ready to do that. I'm ready to address these issues on day thank, one. Thank you. Congressman, 30 seconds to respond. There is a role for Congress to play, which is why I co-sponsored a companion bill of Senator Tim Scott, the only African-American Republican in the Senate. And it's my opponent's supporters, Senator Durbin and Senator Duckworth, that voted not to even allow that bill to be debated. Many of the issues that she just brought up would have been addressed by passing that bill, and we could have passed our own in the House and worked out a compromise. The good news is many issues here in Illinois have already been addressed. Tom Schneider, who runs the Central Illinois Law Enforcement Training Center, said two weeks more of de-escalation techniques Thank and social justice you. already exists in Illinois. Thank you, Congressman. That's time. Ms. Dirksen Londrigan, 30 seconds. I want to reiterate that we can start by looking at law enforcement, and we have to, uh, so that we don't have any more George Floyd's, Breonna Taylor's, or Ahmaud Arbery's. 
But if we stop there, then we are missing what people are protesting about. And it's about the systemic injustice that, we, that they are living every day in their lives. So we have to address it in our health care and in our economic systems. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We go back to the state capitol for our next question from Mark Maxwell. Congressman Davis, President Trump promised to appoint judges to the Supreme Court who will rule to overturn Roe versus Wade. You've predicted that the Senate will, in fact, confirm Judge Amy Coney Barrett to the nation's high court. When asked if that could mean the end of Roe versus Wade, President Trump told Fox News, quote, it's certainly possible, and maybe they do it in a different way. Maybe they'd give it back to the states. You just don't know what's going to happen. So, Congressman, if there's a vote, to codify Roe versus Wade and make it the law of the land, protecting abortion rights, how would you vote? I'm pro-life, Mark. You know that. And I'm proudly able to stand here and say, outside the cases of rape, incest, or death of the mother, I want to protect the unborn. Now, the Supreme Court is not an issue that we face in the House. We don't get to confirm those judges. I certainly hope that we can come together as a country and ensure that we have a full Supreme Court once this justice is nominated and confirmed by the U.S. Senate, not by the House. We need to come together as our country. We need to not just talk about issues that divide us. That's one of the reasons why I think you've seen a political litmus test when it comes to coronavirus and our coronavirus responses. We live in the greatest country in the history of the world, Mark. We have opportunities here that people in other countries only dream about. Instead, we fight and bicker over political litmus tests instead of actually recognizing what we do well. The United States of America is going to get through this coronavirus when we stop playing politics and start realizing that we've invested in therapeutics, we've invested in vaccine development, we've invested historic amounts in medical research funding together. But that doesn't get a lot of TV attention. Unfortunately, what does is where we all disagree. If you look back, I think history is going to judge Republicans and Democrats in Congress very favorably at the beginning of this pandemic because we stood together and we got things done. Thank you, Ms. Dirksen Londrigan. 30 seconds. I trust women. I trust women to make their own decisions about their own bodies without the government interfering in those very personal medical decisions, period. When you're in Congress, what you can do is you can do what Congressman Davis has done, which is vote to defund Planned Parenthood and vote to overturn the Affordable Care Act and put women back into the dark and ages, and that, we won't that go. That is time. Congressman Davis, 30 seconds for a rebuttal. I don't believe government should be in charge of our health care, unlike my opponent. Her plan would Except put government in charge, and it would allow rural hospitals throughout this district to close. That's not helping women or anyone else get the health care they deserve. I want to make sure that our health care decisions are done via patient, via physician, via doctors and medical professionals. That's how I voted. That's how I'll continue to vote. Because that is how we have the greatest health care system in the world that saved my wife and many others. Our next question is from Chris Coates in Decatur. And thank you, Brian. The question is about camp. And the question is about campaign donations. What kind of campaign donations have you received from groups affiliated with Speaker Madigan? And do you plan to return that financial assistance? Happy to answer that in just a second. I want to go back and respond to something that Congressman Davis said, that he doesn't believe that the government should have a role in people's health care. That should be qualified with, unless you have a uterus. Because then he seems fine with the government telling women what to do with their bodies. All right, moving on. Um, look, what's, what's going on right now with, uh, you know, with the speaker, with the investigations, uh, you know, what I have said all along is that um, you know, nobody is above the law, that these investigations have to be thorough. Anyone proved to be involved in this bribery scheme um, has got to step aside immediately. And while this bribery scheme is unfolding and they're getting to the bottom of it, there is actually an admittedly guilty party in this bribery scheme, and that is ComEd Exelon. Now, it is worth noting here 
that Comed Exelon has donated directly to my opponent. Over $64,000 came from the CEO, executives, and the corporate PAC from Comed Exelon. Now, they donated this money to my opponent while they were bribing politicians to keep their rates higher. So when we're talking about what's happening here in Illinois and the dirty politics, Congressman Davis is right in the middle of it. Congressman Davis, 30 seconds. Yeah, I, didn't, I didn't think you could be more dishonest, but here we go. This is an opportunity for you to denounce Speaker Madigan and the corruption at ComEd. ComEd is not Exelon. I will not sacrifice the hundreds of employees that work at the Exelon nuclear facility because of your misinformation. I have never taken any donations from ComEd executives. Exelon is not under a plea agreement. It's your supporters and the $82,000 or the, the thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars that you took directly you. from ComEd that, lobbyists who have been implicated. You need to time. stand up Thank for Speaker Madigan and you won't. Thank you, Congressman. Ms. Dirksen Londrigan, 30 seconds. If you look at the advertisements when you're watching a White Sox game, you know what it says? It says ComEd. Parent, it says a company of Exelon. Exelon owns ComEd, Congressman, but you know that. You accepted money both from Exelon's PAC and from the ComEd, Exelon CEO and executives. I know it's a drop in the bucket compared to the over $3 million that you have taken from corporate PACs, but it is significant. Okay. And we also asked you to send us your questions at IllinoisNewsroom.org. They are on video. The first one is directed to Congressman Rodney Davis. Hello, my name is Nicholas Lesky, and I live in Urbana. Given the large amount of people who have left Illinois in recent years, what investments can be made in our infrastructure to help create jobs and grow our economy, to help encourage people to stay and also attract outsiders to live and work in Illinois? Congressman, 90 seconds. Well, thank you, Nick. First, I want to address what my opponent just said. She basically is accusing Exelon, who's not been accused of any wrongdoing, as a parent company of a corrupt organization that's helped fund and run her campaigns, along with a plea agreement that's costing ComEd $200 million. And it's, not, it's a deferred prosecution agreement. They better cooperate. There are guilty pleas. There are people that have been implicated that have given directly to her campaign. Speaker Madigan is a target of this investigation. And my opponent continues to raise hundreds of thousands of dollars with Speaker Madigan to fund her campaign. She won't tell him to resign because all you got to do is go look at our financial disclosures on clerk.house.gov and you can see her entire income to pay her mortgage and expenses comes from lobbying, corporate, lobbying for corporate clients and lobbying Mike Madigan. But what we can do, Nick, is we can make sure we don't pass this graduated tax amendment that's going to allow people to leave Illinois in droves, especially those who can most afford it. Raising taxes on Illinoisans, like my opponent supports, by getting rid of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act to put more money in Illinois citizens' pockets and family budget, is going to be a reason why they leave. So we've got to protect taxes, but we also have to make sure we incentivize staying here. Low-cost energy is a way to do that. And my opponent's plan would shut all those plants down. Well, the original question was what investments can be made in our infrastructure to help create jobs and grow our economy and help encourage people to stay. Uh, Ms. Dirksen Londrigan, do you want to? Yes, I'm happy to answer seconds? that. It's so important. Look, I think that Illinois should be a role model because Illinois has passed the Future Energy Jobs Act. So we're building uh, solar and wind farms. We're making investments in the jobs of the future. And that's what we need to be doing. And these are good union jobs. These are jobs that they can't ship overseas. These are jobs that people can raise their families on. And these are jobs that are going to be there 10, 20 years from now. That's what we should be doing. Thank you, Congressman. 30 seconds on infrastructure. The policies that my opponent supports have shut down coal plants and coffee and also Kincaid. Good union paying jobs uh, leaving those communities. That's, that's not how we build infrastructure. We build infrastructure by having baseload generators that are like coal and nuclear facilities. You can't run the American economy on wind and solar alone, but they can help. But let's invest in our roads. That's what I've done over the past seven and a half years in Congress. I've helped invest in mass transit. 
road projects, bridge projects, infrastructure. That's why I went to D.C., and that's why I want to stay. Thank you. We have another taped question sent to IllinoisNewsroom.org. This one is directed to Betsy Dirksen Londrigan. Hi, my name is Bailey Parks Moore, and I'm from Champaign. My question pertains to agriculture because that affects my daily life. Agriculture is important to the central Illinois economy. My question is, what is your position on farm policy, and what would you do to support family farms and agribusinesses? Thank you. Sure. Seconds. Yeah, I'm happy to answer that. You know, I was happy to introduce everybody uh, through our, fir you know, our first commercial uh, to my family's farm, which is in Niantic. It's where my grandma grew up. And while we've, you know, during this time of COVID, I still have had the opportunity to do several roundtables with farmers. And in fact, uh, two weeks ago, I was down in Greene County uh, visiting with a farmer named Mark. Um, he actually had invited Congressman Davis to come down for about a year now, and he hasn't done it. So I went down to go look at his land and figure out what the issues were. Historic flooding due to climate change, uh, soil erosion, these are issues that aren't just here and now. These are issues that are coming down the pike. This is why I believe that we have to make significant investments in conservation so that we can help our farmers prepare for the future. They operate on such slim margins that if we want them to maintain their family farms, and we do, then we need to be here to help them make those changes. You know, and we also need to make sure that our farmers have markets to sell to. You know, our soybean and corn farmers really had a double whammy between the trade war that the president started and the historic flooding. So they need markets to sell to. And they need a representative in Congress who is going to be there for them, who is going to listen to them and take their concerns back to Washington, D.C., and help them. Thank you. Congressman, 30 seconds. Our farmers have a voice in Washington. You can ask them. It's why I'm endorsed and supported by all the major farm groups in this country and in central Illinois. I went to Congress promising that I would end the never-ending extensions of farm bills. Proud to say I've helped write, too, because I listened to you, our agricultural sector. We helped write them together, which is why I enjoy your support, and I look forward to making them better in the future. Ms. Dirksen Lundrigan, 30 seconds. You know, I supported the final version of the farm bill. Um, I didn't support the version that Congressman Davis voted for and passed because in that first version, it cut SNAP funding. That's food. It cut food out of the mouths of people who need it. It also cut conservation dollars. It changed the formula. So some of our, some of our dollars that stayed here in Illinois would have been swept out to places like California, um, Ohio, and Colorado. I want to represent Illinois farmers. And the questions are now over. And with the limited time we have remaining, we turn to closing statements by coin toss. Congressman Davis is up first. Congressman, one minute. First off, I want to say thank you to everybody here for making this debate happen. Thank you to my opponent for debating the issues that are important to this district and to our voters. I asked for your vote when I first ran for Congress a few short years ago, telling you I was going to go lead in a bipartisan way. I'm proud to again tell you I'm the 13th most bipartisan member of the House out of 435, the most bipartisan member, Republican or Democrat, in Illinois. We've helped write farm bills together. We've helped write infrastructure bills together. And we've helped solve a piece of the student loan debt crisis. These are the opportunities that you've given me, and I don't take them lightly. But one thing that is frustrating to me right now is the hate and vitriol that we see in politics. Just this weekend, I lost a friend and a supporter, Bill Garrett, in a tragic car accident in Christian County. I would talk to Bill every morning, and he would sit in the same chair at the coffee shop. I went there today and get a, didn't get a chance to see Bill. Let's make this political environment better because he doesn't get a chance to anymore. Thank you. And now a closing statement from Betsy Dirksen Londrigan. You also have one minute. Thank you. And thank you for tonight. I really appreciate it. And thank you to the congressman for being here to debate. Look, we have a choice to make on November 3rd. I got into this race to protect health care, to make sure that every person who needs to get to the doctor can get to the doctor to make sure that you can afford your prescription drugs, to make sure that your family doesn't go bankrupt because of one chronic illness 
or a medical emergency. And we, if we want to do better, and we can do better, we have to elect better. We have a congressman right now who has voted 11 times to repeal the Affordable Care Act with no replacement, who has taken millions from corporate PACs and votes their way, who gives the tax cuts to the rich. We can do better, so let's elect better. I'm asking for your vote on November 3rd so that I can represent you, my neighbors in central Illinois. Lower your taxes and protect your health care. Thank you. And that is it for this 13th Congressional District debate. We'd like to thank the candidates, Betsy Dirksen Londrigan and Congressman Rodney Davis. We'd also like to thank our panel of journalists, Mark Maxwell of WCIA TV, Mary Hansen of NPR Illinois, and Chris Coates of Lee Enterprises. Thanks also to the League of Women Voters of Champaign County, including our timekeeper, Carolyn Trimble. And finally, a hearty thank you to WCIA TV for hosting us in its brand new set. To see this debate again or share it with a friend, visit the Illinois Public Media channel on YouTube. I'm Brian Mackey from Illinois Public Media. On behalf of the crew and everyone else involved in tonight's production, thank you, stay safe, and good night.